This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Summit by the sea. The heads of the world's two largest economies meet for the first time ever. They've got a lot to discuss and both have a lot at stake. Military options. The White House vows a response to Syria over its chemical weapons attacks. But what will that response be and how will markets react? Stuck in the middle. They're not baby boomers or millennials. But if Gen Xers have a lot of spending power, why are they being ignored? Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, April 6th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Tyler Matheson. Sue Herrera is off tonight. Well, the talks are likely to be tense. In diplomatic parlance, blunt or frank. The stakes for consumers, investors, ordinary citizens are high. Chinese President Xi Jinping arrived today in Florida for a summit by the sea with President Trump. On the agenda, trade, jobs, and North Korea. Kayla Tausche reports tonight from Palm Beach. The leaders of the world's two economic superpowers meeting for the first time. President Trump on home turf at his resort in Florida as a 24-hour summit begins. China's President Xi Jinping greeted by Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. The two met last month and Tillerson echoed Beijing's call for mutual respect and a win-win relationship, but drew a harder line on Thursday. Even as we share a desire to work together, the United States does recognize the challenges China can present to American interest. The meeting is the toughest diplomatic test yet for Trump and a young administration just 77 days in with several key posts still unfilled and a diverse set of views on China, some of which fueled Trump's campaign ire. We can't continue to allow China to rape our country, and that's what they're doing. It's the greatest theft in the history of the world. That's since been met with sharp rebukes from China's second-in-command. We don't wish to see a trade war breaking out between the two countries. That wouldn't make our trade fairer, and that hurts both economies. But urgency came from North Korea's continued test launches of missiles two days before she and Trump were to meet, before that during Trump's meeting with Japan's prime minister. White House officials say China still has economic influence over North Korea where political influence has faded. China is its neighbor's only trading partner and source of currency, propping up an economy just $1,200 in gross income per capita. The focus on North Korea means economic issues will take a back seat, but White House officials say a framework will be discussed for dealing with trade, tariffs and currencies and setting deadlines for the near future. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kayla Tausche, Palm Beach, Florida. Well, the Trump administration has its goals, but there are also things the Chinese leader wants to accomplish at the meeting with President Trump. Yunus Yun has that part of the story from Beijing. For President Xi's visit to Mar-a-Lago, China has a message for President Donald Trump. Don't blame us for America's problems. The foreign ministry has been telegraphing what President Xi and his delegation are likely to emphasize at the summit, that China has contributed greatly to the American economy. The foreign ministry rattled off a list of statistics to back China's argument, saying 40% of China's trade surplus is generated by U.S. companies here, 2.6 million American jobs were created because of bilateral trade and investment, and each American American family saves $850 a year because of cheap Chinese goods. The message has been reiterated in the state press, with the Communist Party's Global Times newspaper running an editorial with a headline that reads, U.S. job losses are not China's fault. In driving home this message, the Chinese are hoping to deflect what they expect to be heavy criticism by Trump over the trade deficit and job losses in manufacturing. The message also provides a window into what Beijing is most worried about, that the meeting could lead to finger-pointing that could destabilize the relationship. 
From Beijing's perspective, what's most important is for President Xi to project strength at this summit. China is facing a leadership reshuffle in the fall. So for domestic reasons, President Xi needs to appear tough. So the worst case scenario for China is if there are any developments that can be perceived as an embarrassment for President Xi. Any signs of open hostility? awkward moments, or a disrespectful tweet. The best case scenario for the Chinese is if they manage to avoid a full-on disagreement on trade, market access, North Korea, and other issues, and if the two sides establish a path to constructive dialogue. Also, if they get reassurances that the Sino-U.S. relationship is on a stable course. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Yunus Yoon in Beijing. On Wall Street today, stocks rose despite the president indicating he is considering a wide range of options following the chemical weapons attack in Syria. Investors took notice, got a little bit jittery, and stocks lost some of their luster. By the close, the DJIA rose 14 points to finish at 20,662. At one point, it was higher by 96 points. NASDAQ was up 14 at the close and the S&P 500 higher by about four and a half. Bob Pisani has more now on the geopolitical rumblings and how they affected the market. Stocks were posting modest gains into the middle of the day and then began to change course after President Trump made comments on Syria and North Korea. The president said that something should happen with the Syrian president following the recent chemical attack. Then Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said that Syrian President Bashar Assad should be removed from power, which appears to be a reversal in the White House's position on Syria. President Trump also said that the United States should be prepared to act alone when it comes to North Korea. Now, this was a fairly rare moment when geopolitical events have had an effect on markets. However, it was a very modest effect. The Dow only dropped about 80 points from its high, and it still ended the day in the green. Now, contrast this to the 200-point drop in the Dow that happened yesterday after the Federal Reserve said that they would be moving to reduce their balance sheet later this year. And then House Speaker Paul Ryan said tax reform could take longer than health care reform. Those comments had a much bigger impact on the market. So here's the bottom line. Geopolitical risk is now surfacing as a risk to markets. But the big risk factors remain the Federal Reserve and any risk to the Trump agenda of tax cuts and infrastructure spending. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. So let's dig a little deeper now on the question of whether investors are starting to pay more attention to global events. Brad McMillan is chief investment officer at Commonwealth Financial Network and joins us now to discuss. Uh, Brad, I don't mean for you to criticize or contradict what Bob Pisani just said, but as you look at the panoply of things that the market and investors must consider, does he have it right that it remains the Fed, the economy, the Trump agenda that are number one in investors' eyes and these geopolitical things that are a distant second and third, maybe? I do agree with him, Tyler. And I think the thing that's remarkable today, and he kind of said this, is not what happened, but what didn't happen. In other words, we have the president of the United States taking one of the naughtiest geopolitical problems and saying we may act alone, and essentially nothing much happened. I think that points out that it is about the fundamentals, it is about the U.S., it is about the economy. Whether that's a good thing or not, I don't know. But I think it's good that people are starting to pay attention abroad again. Well, it, it does uh, strike me as, uh, as events unfolded around mid-afternoon today with Mr. Tillerson's press conference and the president flying down and making some uh, comments on, on uh, Air Force One. It brings into, into position here the idea that w- with respect to North Korea, the, uh, the other effect there is on China. With ref- respect to Syria, the other country affected there is Russia, two of our biggest rivals exactly. with stakes in these fights. Well, I think when you look at Syria, for example, first of all, you have to consider we have troops there. We have enormous forces throughout the Middle East, and we have for, you know, since the year 2000, at least. So, you know, whatever we do, the Russians know we're there. We've actually worked with them on strikes against ISIS. So this is not something that's going to be too disruptive. And in any event, we're not that on that good terms with the Russians anyway. So whatever we do, modest effects, if any. Mm -hmm. China, of course, it's a much bigger relationship. We are still on reasonably good terms with them. We'll see how that works out. 
So, and North Korea is right in the middle of everything. Mm -hmm. But you got to remember, too, we have South Korea to consider. We have Japan to consider. Absolutely. In other words, we're not going to act on this alone. I mean, you can, you can make comments, you can issue tweets, but policy, particularly military policy, has to go through the normal process. Let's come back to where we the let's come back reaction. to where we started, which was a discussion more on on U.S. fundamentals and the economy. Tomorrow, the jobs report. Quick thought on it. How important is it? It's very important, but it's only important on the downside. If we get moderate news to good news, over 180 or something, the recovery continues. If it's well below that, we have to ask some tough questions. Brad, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a, have a great evening. We appreciate it. Brad McMillan, Commonwealth thank Financial you, Tyler. Network. The other big story for the market today is tomorrow's jobs report. So far this year, the labor market has seen significant gains. Nearly a half million people have found jobs so far. But as Hampton Pearson reports, March may have been a month of pullbacks. In March, it was winter storm Stella blanketing much of the Northeast and Midwest that most economists believe slowed the pace of hiring. The consensus forecast sees employers adding 175,000 workers to payrolls last month, with the unemployment rate holding steady at 4.7 percent. That's below the 237,000 per month average in the first two months of the year. We do see some pulling forward of job gains in the spring for weather-related industries such as construction because projects that wouldn't have been started in January and February uh, under normal weather circumstances may have been started that way in 2017. However, for the second straight month, there was bullish private sector job growth. The closely watched ADP survey says employers added 263,000 workers and jobless claims fell by 25,000 last week, the biggest drop in two years. But there are signs of a slowdown in hiring as businesses wait for a better read on the prospects for President Trump's proposed tax cuts and infrastructure spending. It's certainly possible that we see a little bit of a slowdown on those fronts because we, I think, at the beginning of the year would have expected that we would have seen more detail on those plans by now. This week's Fed minutes showed monetary policymakers remain concerned about possible wage growth and also are reluctant to gauge the possible impact of the Trump economic agenda. But I would say that the Fed obviously wants to see the job market continuing to heal. It wants to have further confidence that inflation is getting closer to its 2 percent target. And what would really help with that is a true acceleration in wage growth. If Friday's jobs report falls short of expectations, some economists are already saying strong underlying economic data is setting the stage for a strong comeback in April. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Hampton Pearson in Washington. Still ahead, the big money behind the big push into the final frontier. I'm in the simulator for Boeing's Starliner capsule, which will start ferrying astronauts to the International Space Station as soon as next year. The space race is heating up, and we have that story coming up on Nightly Business Report. plans to pull out of Iowa's health care exchange. The decision comes three days after Wellmark Blue Cross Blue Shield said it would not sell new plans in the state next year. That leaves Iowa with just two other insurers. Aetna covers about 30,000 people in the Hawkeye state who buy insurance through the Obamacare exchanges. The company's still evaluating if it will sell plans in three other states. House Speaker Paul Ryan says Republicans are making progress on health care, but there's no bill yet. Today, he indicated that new legislation will take time as various GOP factions work out their differences. I actually think that divide is narrowing quite quickly. Uh, what this idea represents is a goal that everyone from the Freedom Caucus to every other group that's represented here is seeking. How do we lower premiums? How do we lower premiums and continue the protections for people with pre-existing conditions? This idea does that. And so this is one of those ideas that narrows differences and brings people closer toward consensus. Health care is just one of the many pieces of unfinished business left in Washington as lawmakers leave for spring break. 
Eamon Javers is covering the story from our nation's capital. Is there, Eamon, really a health care timeline now, or is it just kind of fluid and amorphous? <laughs> if fluid and amorphous is a good way of putting it right now, Tyler. The timeline remains not right now, not necessarily anytime soon. The problem is uh, for Speaker Paul Ryan, he's trying to wrangle the House Freedom Caucus of conservatives who want to dismantle Obamacare entirely, and he's got to balance that against other forces in the Republican conference who don't want to dismantle some of the more politically popular uh, aspects of Obamacare. Uh, Obamacare itself continues to rise in popularity as uh, more people across the country confront the prospect of it being taken away. So that political dynamic hasn't changed since the failure of the president's health care plan uh, a while ago. Uh, they're still trying to negotiate up on Capitol Hill. Paul Ryan is trying to bring his Republicans together in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. If he is successful in doing that, he still has a challenge, which is the Senate Republicans, who don't see eye to eye with any of them on all of that as well. Let's switch to tax reform. Speaker Ryan rattling the markets yesterday when he, he sort of pushed off the, uh, the timeline for tax reform. Today, though, Freedom Caucus's Mark Meadows said it could come by August. What are we hearing here? Well, look, August is an ambitious timeline. It's always been an ambitious timeline. The Trump administration has set that out as their goal, but this is a very complicated piece of legislation uh, that the Trump administration is trying to move through. The challenge that they have is that they want it to be uh, not a deficit-busting bill. That is, if you cut taxes dramatically, you're going to raise the deficit. So how do they raise revenue at the same time they're lowering tax rates? One idea was a border adjustment tax. That's not necessarily going to fly uh, in the Trump White House. They floated for about a minute and a half this week the idea of a value-added tax or carbon taxes. Uh, after about a minute and a half trial balloon, that mm. was shot down as well. So they're still stuck with this idea of how do they raise revenue in all this. They don't have a good answer for that. Let's switch to the confirmation here, a vote uh, on uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court judge, Mr. Gorsuch. Where does it stand? Well, as of right now, Republicans in the Senate are clearing the way for that, and they're doing that uh, in relatively dramatic fashion by Senate standards. They call it the nuclear option. It's not as fiery as all that. Uh, but what it means in the Senate is that ultimately they're going to lower the threshold needed to pass the Supreme Court nomination uh, from a 60-vote margin to a 50-plus-1 vote margin. So uh, when they change the, the Senate rules, that is a dramatic step by Senate standards. Uh, they will be able to get Mr. Gorsuch confirmed and Probably by uh, late tomorrow, he will be confirmed to the Supreme Court. The White House is already planning a swearing-in ceremony for him. Eamon, thanks very much. Eamon Javers in Washington. Well, Unilever unveils restructuring plans, big ones, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The consumer products giant, which we recently told you spurned a $143 billion takeover offer from Kraft Heinz, said it was selling its spreads division and merging its two food businesses in an effort to drive growth. The maker of Dove Soap, don't try to eat that, folks, and Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream, which is delicious, also said it plans to raise its dividend and launch a more than $5 billion share buyback program. Shares rose a fraction to $50 even. Sunoco will sell the majority of its convenience stores to 7-Eleven's Japanese parent company for more than $3 billion. The latest move represents Sunoco's desire to narrow its focus to its fuel business. Sunoco shares up 20% on that news to 28.69. Subprime online lender Elevate Credit made its market debut today on the New York Stock Exchange. In its second attempt to go public, the company increased its share offering while cutting the offering price. Despite cutting the price, Elevate CEO says he's still happy with the results. We raised uh, just a little under the amount that we originally intended to raise, so we'll be able to, to pay down the uh, debt we wanted to pay down and really fuel that ongoing growth we see serving such a massive market. Shares rose 19 percent to $7.76. Goldman Sachs slapped a sell rating on the semiconductor maker Advanced Micro Devices, saying it's not confident the company will be able to compete against Intel and NVIDIA. The firm also questioned the company's ability to meet fan financial analysts' targets and gave the stock an $11 price target. Rare sell rating sent shares of AMD down 6% to $13.27. Well, Amazon plans to hire 30,000 workers over the next year. The positions will be in the U.S., but part-time. The jobs will be in its virtual customer service unit and in its warehouses. It's part of a larger hiring spree by the company, which said in January 
that it would add 100,000 full-time jobs. And speaking of a Amazon, Jeff Bezos, its CEO, is taking the space race to a whole new level. The Amazon founder says he's going to sell a billion in Amazon stock every year to help fund his space rocket venture, Blue Origin. His goal? Space colonization. And he's not the only one. Morgan Brennan joins us from a space symposium in Colorado Springs, where entrepreneurs are gathered to share their sky-high ambitions. This is much harder than it looks. At the 33rd Annual Space Symposium, Oh, no! The mission is clear. To take not just a small step, but a giant leap for all mankind towards the final frontier. We are in the future going to take people up to the stratosphere. Jane Pointer is the co-founder and CEO of Worldview, a company which hopes to, in the near future, take passengers for the ride of their life. We take them up under these large high-altitude balloons, which affords an incredibly gentle way to get people up to the edge of space. We can also hang out there looking out these incredibly large windows at this beautiful view for hours at a time. And of course, we have a bar on board our spaceship. Taking people to space is something Amazon's Jeff Bezos has dreamed of since high school. At the symposium, the billionaire showed off his space startup Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket and a model of the crew capsule, which will carry six paying customers at a time to the edge of space. Bezos hopes the first passengers will take flight late next year. We're not going to take any shortcuts, uh, so we'll put humans on this vehicle when we're ready and not a second sooner. Bezos, like other spacepreneurs, knows the biggest challenge is cost. Most of the things you want to do in space that are truly interesting right now have a very high price of admission. If we can reduce the cost of launch by a factor of 10 and then by a factor of 100, you will be living in a completely new world. It'll be a golden age of space exploration. A golden age that will likely include fierce competition. Rival SpaceX is also focused on cost, having just reused a rocket for the first time ever. That ability to recycle hardware and to eventually do so efficiently like an airplane could transform the industry. Much of this, the stuff of sci-fi stories, yet many here believe could soon become reality, especially as NASA, which governs and guides the U.S. civilian space sector, continues its own development with Boeing and Aerojet Rocketdyne of the most powerful rocket ever built. The human element is always, you know, just so exciting and so... We're really, really interested in you know, the heavy lift rocket that is going to enable us to go do all the deep space exploration that is, you know, it's the stuff that's been in movies recently. And, and it's so exciting that we're going to get humans out there. We're going to get beyond the moon. We're going to get them out to Mars. And Mars is sort of going to be the Atlanta airport for the, for the solar system. So it's just a very exciting time. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Still to come, the forgotten generation. Millennial-obsessed companies are leaving one age group in the dust, and we'll tell you why that trend could be costing big firms. Advertisers and big brands are ignoring Generation X for millennials. According to Entrepreneur.com, today's brands are so focused on millennials that they've overlooked the 61 million Gen Xers who make enough money to be a huge growth opportunity. So why are they being ignored and what can be done to engage them? Dean Crutchfield, a brand expert with his own firm, the Dean Crutchfield Company, joins us now to discuss. Dean, good as always to see Absolutely. you. These poor Gen Xers, they're being ignored. Yes, 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 they are indeed. They have been for some years now. Everyone's the allure of the, the, the millennials and now, you know, the Gen Z, the even younger ones. So anybody up to 36, 37 years old has the top priority for most brands. And sometimes you have to ask questions as to why that is. Is it because the millennials are the bigger generation in terms of numbers or because 
it is between those ages of sort of 18 and 35 that people supposedly um, create their brand identities, affiliate. Yes. They, once a Crest user, always a Crest user. Yes, absolutely. You've got to get into that younger generation to get them involved with your brand, build that loyalty, build that recognition. So it's an absolute critical part of the population. It's a very important part of a, of a consumer base that com companies are after. But to your point, Gen X, Gen Y are huge markets. And guess what? They've got a lot of money. And so do we baby boomers, Dean, and don't you forget it. <laughs> Let, I want to switch very quickly to two things. One is the advertising exodus from the popular television show, The O'Reilly Factor. What do you make of it, and, and do you see any end in sight? Um, I think there is no end in sight here. This is a serious situation. I think what it shows you is brands, you know, do act themselves. They are accountable. They are responsible. And they make those people they partner with just the same. And this is a case where these brands have basically said, this is not good. This is not right. And we don't like how Fox has been behaving in terms of their response. So understandably, they are annoyed and they're flustered. And it could damage their brand reputation, which is absolutely paramount for them. And they must protect it. 30 seconds on the Pepsi ad uh, with one of the uh, Kardashians handing a can of Pepsi to a policeman amidst a, a demonstration. They've pulled it. Was it just a clumsy ad? It was, it was a clumsy ad. I mean, there's three things they did wrong. Number one, you've got to know your audience. And in this case, it was the millennials and the Gen Zs that they were targeting. Number two, jumping on the back of a national protest movement with a self-indulged ad about your product is, gonna, is not going to fly, and that clearly didn't happen. And then, actually, what I think that hasn't been talked about, which actually did kill the ad, was it was too politically correct. And I think that just stalled it, and it didn't give it any hope whatsoever. Dean, we covered a lot there. Thank you. Terrific. Dean Crutchfield of the Dean Crutchfield Company. That's Nightly Business Report for tonight. For Sue Herrera, I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for watching. Have a great evening, everybody, and we'll see you right back here tomorrow night.